Okay, this video is going to be chapter 31B, where we're going to continue to talk about atherosclerosis <clears throat> and coronary artery disease, heart disease. Um, I previously have earlier chapters where I talked about a lot of the basics and had the pictures. Here I'm just going to go into a little more detail. Um, and the first thing I was going to say is that Dr. Esselstyn has said that coronary artery disease is the number one cause of death in the United States and the Western world but stents and surgeries are not an adequate treatment. That's an important point. They're not an adequate treatment. And you know, Dr. McDougall's given good lectures showing that they really don't cause any significant increase in longevity for people with just the typical symptoms, you know, chronic cardiac-related chest pain, angina. Uh, patients tend to very much overestimate the benefits of stents and cabbage. Cabbage means coronary artery bypass graft. That's open heart surgery, where they, they put a bypass graft um, around the blocked coronary artery. Recently, an orthopedic surgeon friend developed angina and had gone for a stent, and then he talks to me afterwards and he says, wow, I'm glad that's over. Thank God I got it fixed in time, had a stent placed in his coronary arteries. And he was quite disappointed when I told him that he's not out of the woods yet. The stent just treats a chronic severe narrowing, stenosis, a blockage, moderate to severe narrowing. But that's not what's most likely to kill you, okay? Theoretically, it's a ruptured plaque, formation of a blood clot in your coronary arteries. And the chronic fixed stenosis is unlikely to progress to thrombosis, okay? The stent will help reduce symptoms, um, but anyways, that's what I'm saying is even an orthopedic surgeon, you know, a doctor who's gone through all that training, like five years post-residency education, still doesn't know a basic thing like this. And that's typical. And orthopods tend to be smarter than the average doctor. It's hard to get an orthopedic surgery. It's a very desirable field compared to most fields. Um, so that's what I'm trying to tell you. Even a relatively smart doctor doesn't know the basics, okay? All right, um, he's, still, he's still at quite a high risk for myocardial infarction, heart attack. Okay, I told him to go on a low-sodium, low-fat, vegan diet with no oil and no caffeine. Um, so that's, that's what I mean. The typical doctor does not know much about heart disease or atherosclerosis. That's why they can't give good advice because they don't understand it themselves. Okay, yeah, patients typically think the stent's going to fix their artery or the bypass surgery is going to fix the problem. No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. <laughs> all that atherosclerosis is still sitting throughout the coronary arteries. It's still sitting not only in the epicardial, the big ones that run on the outer surface of the heart, but in the intramyocardial branches. One of the things you notice, if you look at you know the inside scoop, cardiologists themselves tend to be in pretty good shape. Most of them are thin, exercise a lot, walk a lot. They know what's going on. Most of them have eventually learned about diet. There's a couple BS artists on the internet. I've seen there's a bunch of cardiologists actually on the internet telling people to eat high fat diets, which I think is completely unethical. That's ridiculous. I don't think you could be a cardiologist and have gone through all that training you know, three years internal medicine residency and then like three years of cardiology potential with a, with a subspecialty fellowship in something like interventional cardiology, echocardiology or something like that, EPS, electrophysiologic studies. How could you do all that training and not by then know uh, the deal about diet? It's pretty obvious. Okay, um, Cleveland Clinic is like one of the most famous cardiac centers in the world and that's where um, Caldwell Esselstyn is from the Cleveland Clinic so how could anybody know about the Cleveland Clinic and not know about Caldwell Esselstyn unless they're an idiot okay or they're full of crap and they're BSing the public as so many of them do okay the other thing too is you know cardiologists know that stents and cabbage are overrated and I'm going to ask you if you're a doctor or if you know doctors have you ever heard of a cardiologist who themselves went and had a stent placed or, a, or had open heart surgery I'm not aware of any I've never known any cardiologist that I've known go for that um, Dr. McDougall said that he had never seen a cardiologist go for a stent or a cabbage okay I, I, that's what I think I recall him saying when he gave a lecture about it one time um, I can tell you another thing. Some people think, well, only the poor people get screwed. No, the rich people get screwed too. My father used to be a rich guy. He went for open heart because it was before I knew. This was like, gosh, you know, close to 30 years ago. I didn't know as much then as I know now. Um, and I, I told him not to, but I, I, I couldn't come down strong enough on it. And then the cardiac surgeon and the cardiologist sort of pushed him into it. Um, <clears throat> I knew a guy, a Stanford graduate. You know, real smart guy, real successful in the business world. And he went to an Ivy League medical center and, 
you know, when he was in his early 50s, he was having chest pain, and they popped a coronary artery stent into him at an Ivy League medical center, okay? And he was quite worried about it, <clears throat> and he actually flew all the way out to where I live, over a 1,000 miles away, because he wanted to talk to me and get the inside scoop on what was going on. And I explained to him all about atherosclerosis, the papers to read, the books to read, and how it all works. And he said to me, why is this information so hard to find? How come I had to fly halfway across the country to get this information from you? How come the Ivy League medical centers did not tell me about Dr. Esselstyn, about Dr. Ornish, about all this epidemiology, about the you know poor outcomes from coronary artery stenting? Um, I, he said, I wish I had, you know, he said, I didn't have time. I was having chest pain. I was afraid I was going to die. I had to get it treated fast is what I was thinking at the time. He says, and what I'm saying here is even this guy, you know, Stanford graduate with a graduate degree, you know, 99 plus percent IQ, access to all this information, IV medical centers, he doesn't get the correct information. So you can bet that a regular average person not affiliated with medicine is never going to get the true story on uh, coronary artery disease and nutrition. The odds of them getting it are near zero. I've had some other real smart friends of mine, graduate degrees, they call me and they say, Pete, we can't figure out this nutrition and health stuff because we constantly constantly see contradictions on the internet. The typical way that you know paleo, keto, carnivore BS is promoted is look at some good looking person who's about 40, 45 years of age and they'll sit there and just lie to the public. And, you know, the public doesn't really understand the physiology of it. They just look at the person and say, hey, he looks, he looks good, he looks honest, and they believe him. They really don't have any skill at judging these things, most people. Um, and they'll tell people nonsense like, oh, you should eat grass-fed beef. Like, that makes much of a difference. Any type of beef is still going to be very high in fat, okay? It's still going to be high in animal protein. It's still going to be very uh, atherogenic. It's going to cause hyperlipidemia. You're not going to win with that, okay? People who eat lots of meat even in the ancient days before all this modern stuff, they still would get a lot of coronary artery atherosclerosis. You can look at the Egyptian mummies for that. You can look at the graveyard studies where they dug up the graveyards. You'll find a lot more um, atherosclerosis-related stuff in populations that ate high-fat diets. That's just how it is. William Craig Roberts, the most famous cardiac pathologist in the world, uh, he recommends the same diet as Esselstyn. Low-fat, low-sodium, only plants, uh, no oil. Um, let's see. Some people will say, well, that's not realistic. Most people are not going to be willing to follow the Esselstyn diet. And you know what I would say is, so what? Most people are stupid. Most people always do the wrong thing in the healthcare game. Okay, for example, you know, every day when you drive to one of the Western hospitals, this is every Western hospital in the world, you see this big line of people out the front door waiting for their medical test. They're going to go get a tube up their butt you know, colonoscopy, get their blood tests, go for CAT scans, MRIs, ultrasounds, all these other medical tests. They love it. I joke, it's like, you know, the Canterbury Tales going on a health pilgrimage. What they don't understand is none of those things are treatments. I mean, you can treat a little bit of stuff. You can remove a polyp with a colon colonoscope. But what I'm saying is what prevents coronary artery disease is go low fat, low sodium vegan. But there's, there, there's no such thing as a nutrition doctor, especially in the United States. Um, there's no billing code to get paid routinely for providing nutritional advice for, for physicians that I'm aware of on, a, on any type of routine practical basis. Um, there's no fellowship in nutrition medicine. It's kind of like a big joke. The only thing that works is low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet, and none of the doctors know it, the dietitians don't know it, and it's not reimbursed, and the patients don't know it, and that's why the patients never get better. And so if a patient you know, tells me, I'd rather die than stop eating meat, no way are you going to make me give up all these things I enjoy, I enjoy life, well, fine, plug up your arteries, become just another fat, stupid statistic. Um, you know, that's your choice, okay? And a lot of people, too, they think the medical system cares about them. They'll say, like, my doctor is good. Well, you know what? There are a lot of good doctors, but here's the problem. It's kind of like the educational system. Even though there's a lot of good doctors and there's a lot of good teachers, the conventional system of medicine and education is designed to ruin the, pay the person, not to help them. So a good doctor is one who goes outside the system, Okay. Because you've got a 99% plus good outcomes if you go low-fat vegan versus you've got relatively poor outcomes if you go down the stent and the cabbage path. Um, 
So, you know, the assumption of this is, you know, the differentiate between standard of care and optimal care. Standard of care is what all the idiots and the chumps get. And it just means the patient is too lazy and stupid to do anything on their own. But a person who has the capacity to learn and is motivated and really wants to get the best of things, they can go for what you would call optimal care. They can optimize their diet, their sleep, their exercise, and all their other habits, the water they drink, etc. Quitting alcohol, no oils, etc. Um... You know, I mean, to any person with a brain in their head, what would you rather do? Eat a healthy diet or would you rather have somebody put you on a heart-lung bypass machine, put you unconscious for anesthesia with medications, then, you know, cut open your sternum with a rotating metal buzzsaw, <laughs> cut, cut veins out of your leg and staple them to your heart. I mean, that's insane <laughs> compared to eat a salad. I think I'll have the salad. Okay, I made a video recently called... Uh, a tale of two cardiac patients where I show the difference in complications, you know, for going for open heart surgery, potential for MOF, multi-organ failure, <laughs> cognitive impairment, et cetera, respiratory failure, tracheostomy, et cetera, versus, you know, if you eat uh, a low-fat vegan diet, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? You might get the Hershey squirts, wet farts for, you know, a week or two. whoop de doo Okay, um, let's see. Populations all over the world that eat low-fat diets, they have really low cholesterol levels, almost zero coronary artery disease, whereas all the westernized populations, you don't even need to look in the chart. Again, if you tell me the patient's over 55 in a western country, I'll know the guy probably has prediabetes, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and he's impotent, okay? And there's a good chance he'll have a lot of the other stuff too, gastroesophageal disease, cataract, gastroesophageal reflux disease, cataracts, etc. Um... Okay, so basically the way people who are smart and motivated go is they go low-fat vegan. That's the health aristocrats, and they just prevent coronary artery disease, prevent the problem. What all the low-IQ chumps do is eat the sad diet and then take their pills and go for stents and surgery. That's pretty much how it goes. Okay, um, and the ones who go down the plant route, they're much healthier, and they live better. The Johnson works better. You know, you save a lot of money. Okay, um, to some extent, too, I'm going to tell you something. Let's talk about balloon angioplasty and stenting because I know how regular people are. They walk into a big, fancy hospital. It's an impressive building, and they're like, wow, isn't this impressive, all this high-tech equipment? Medicine has really made so much progress in the last, whatever, 30, 40, 50 years. And, you know, cardiologists will talk about balloon angioplasty or something, and they'll talk about how the balloon angioplasty will rupture the atherosclerotic plaque. And the reason why I think that's funny is if you then open up the standard cardiology textbook and you'll say, what causes myocardial infarction? It's going to say the rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque. Okay, so I just want to make sure, do you understand this? The cardiology standard dogma is that a rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque causes heart attack. And then if you ask them, how do they treat coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis in the coronaries, they will tell you, inflate a balloon to rupture an atherosclerotic plaque. <clears throat> Excuse me? That sounds like uh, not the smartest thing in the world to do. Now, they're also going to tell you, well, they typically have a balloon-delivered stent. There's a, there's a metal stent on top of the balloon and that it smushes the atherosclerotic plaque up against the arterial wall um, when the stent is deployed. But it's not that simple. You're messing around inside the coronary arteries with a guide wire. It looks, looks like it's like a guitar string moving around the stent and the angioplasty catheter tracks over it. The stent balloon extends typically, you know, a significant distance beyond the metal stent. Okay, the stent is attached to the center of the balloon. It doesn't cover the entire balloon. So yes, you are rupturing atherosclerotic plaques, both proximal and distal to where the stent is deployed. Okay, um, and of course, you're not treating the distal smaller vessels. You're not treating the intramyocardial smaller branches. Okay, and the only reason this doesn't cause more problems is because it's not the main problem with atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a blood clot. You want to avoid things that cause blood clots like high LDL cholesterol, like high uric acid, like chronic systemic inflammation, okay, like hypertension like diabetes, things that increase blood viscosity, high-fat meals. Okay, so here's a question I often hear. How long does it take for a patient to improve after starting a vegan diet? And they'll often show improvement in the first week, and that's because 
as soon as you avoid the high fat meal, your red blood cells will now be able to flow more separately from each other, more individually, and they'll be more effective at delivering oxygen. You know, that can improve oxygen delivery to tissues by like 15 to 20 percent. Um, so just avoiding one high fat meal, you'll start to begin to improve blood flow. Also, the epithelium, the endothelium is the lining of the arteries, will start to recover and it'll start to produce nitric oxide again once you no longer have these inhibitors of nitric oxide like the high fat meals, the uric acid, and the sodium, okay? Um, your LDL cholesterol comes down, you're not getting the low formation, the endothelium is making more nitric oxide, it's a vasodilator, meaning it opens up the diameter of the artery. Um, it also has an antiplatelet effect, meaning it prevents the platelets from sticking together. All of these things will help improve oxygen delivery to the tissue. Um, and with time, the atherosclerotic plaque itself, the blood clot in the arterial wall, can get partially reabsorbed. The fat can be reabsorbed and removed from it. The necrotic, you know, dead tissue material can be removed from it. The acellular fibrosis and the calcification probably are not going to change. I know some people are talking about really slow possible partial reabsorption of the calcium. Okay, fine. But for practical purposes, that's not going to happen too fast. And I don't know how much it really happens. Okay, um, because the top of the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve is relatively flat, uh, a person might not notice that so much after a high fat meal. But if you start getting a little more compromised, a lot of baseline atherosclerosis, perhaps poor lungs from emphysema, asthma, other conditions or you got sleep apnea or something, this will be a more important thing, that 15 to 20 percent um, of increased oxygen delivery. Talking about PO2, not about O2 sat. Okay, um, what about the research of Meyer Friedman? Meyer Friedman showed that when patients ate a high fat meal, they occluded some of the small arteries in their eyes transiently. You know, it didn't happen completely, otherwise they'd go blind. But was not good to see a bunch of capillaries, uh, small arterioles disappearing in the eye. They had an 80 times magnification microscope. How did he show that? He fed patients a high-fat meal, then looked at their eyes at 80 times microscope. The lipid part, necrotic core, and recent thrombus within an atherosclerotic plaque can be reabsorbed. I talked about that. Okay, here's some of the landmark papers if anybody wants to look them up. Peter Quo, 1959, effect of lipemia on coronary and peripheral arterial circulation in patients with essential hyperlipidemia. Okay. So the higher the fat, the worse the circulation. A uh, single high-fat meal decreased oxygen saturation from 96% to 92.5%. Um, angina pectoris induced by fat ingestion in, so the PO2 went down a lot more than that, Inge induced by fat ingestion in patients with coronary artery disease. Okay, Angina occurred at peak lipemia because he checked their blood lipid levels every 30 minutes. Typically about five hours postprandial it was worse. There is essentially no fat in the blood if none is eaten. Okay, so a fat meal that was given was like cream, milk, and butter fat, so dairy fat. Okay, then Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosenman did a similar experience looking, you know, at omega-6 cooking oils. And they did this by looking at the eye was one of the versions of their experiment with the big 80 times microscope. They fed people 67% fat meal, and then the conjunctival arteries were disappearing due to low formation. The blood flow became very sluggish. Um, unsaturated fats like the omega-6 cooking oils were even worse, more prolonged through low formation and decreased oxygen delivery to tissues. So it's a disaster, this stuff. That's why you should never eat oil. All oil is bad. All of them. Olive oil, omega-3, canola oil, they're all bad. You should not eat them. They're a highly processed, super fat, toxic food. My advice is don't eat that junk. Okay, uh, so fixed stenosis can decrease as well as the endothelial function improving, getting more nitric vasodilator out there. Avoiding the SAD diet, you avoid a lot of its vasoconstrictors like sodium, like uric acid, and you can even calcium can have a bit of that effect. Vegan diet has vasodilators like potassium and magnesium, the things you want to open up your artery to get better blood flow to improve healing. It also, vegan diet also has more nitric uh, nitrates that are precursors for nitric oxide. You get some sunshine, you release uh, nitric oxide precursors from your subcutaneous tissues. It all helps you. Um, okay, so we're going to call it, that's it for today, th chapter 31B, and uh, then we'll do 31C, you know, probably tomorrow, sometime soon. I uh, hope that was helpful.